Hello again. I'm back with another clock, and this one is a Sangamo. Actually, it's a Hamilton Sangamo. Some subscribers reached out to me suggesting I might enjoy working on one of these. So I began looking for one, and what I found is that they're really expensive clocks. Um, I was finding some non-working ones that were being sold from anywhere from $60 to $70, and ones that were working were going for anywhere from $160 to $375. This one I was able to find on eBay for only $14. So I wasn't sure how bad a condition it was in, but I had to grab it. And the seller said that it was non-working. He uh, plugged it in, nothing happened, and that it had a loose spindle. And once I got it, I realized that it had a lot of issues. And I'll try to show. When I turned it around, it was kind of all falling apart like this. And what I discovered was that, I'll put the back plate on, there's supposed to be a lever here. This is a non-self-starting clock. You flip the lever down, that's what makes the second hand start. That's missing. There's a couple of threaded nuts that go through these holes here, attaching to these screws to hold this back plate on. Those are missing. And the set knob that attaches here is also missing. And what I realized when the guy spoke about uh, loose spindles he's talking about these and the reason they're loose like this is because the clock is missing its base so if i am able to repair this one i'm going to have to come up with some way to try to manufacture a new base for it i tried to find some repair videos on sangamo clocks and couldn't find any the only thing i found was a repair video for a sangamo electric meter I did find one 17 second video showing a clock like this and it was just showing how this second hand works and apparently on these clocks it's not a second hand it's sort of a, a dial or a disc in the center here and that rotates around giving you the seconds. I looked up some of the history on Sangamo and found it to be quite interesting. I came across a website pretty much devoted to Sangamo clocks and I'm going to put the link uh, up on with this video so you can take a look at that. But briefly, in 1896, the Illinois Watch Company was formed. Uh, the owner was a fellow named Jacob Bunn, along with his son. And an electrical engineer who was looking to build electric meters approached them and asked would they be interested in doing this. Uh, the owner passed on the idea, but he gave it to his son, who liked it and agreed to do it. So that is when the Sangamo Electric Company was founded. That was in 1899. Apparently, they used the same facilities to build the electric meters that they were using to make their watches. An induction motor was designed for the meters, and an engineer realized that this could also be used to wind the mainspring in a clock. And they began producing clocks in 1926. Because current was unreliable in the 20s, the motor was used to wind a mainspring that would run for 24 hours. So if power was out for a while, the clock would still keep good time. And when the power came back on, it would rewind the mainspring. They advertised it as an electrically wound clock. In 1928, the Hamilton Watch Company bought the Illinois Watch Company, and they joined forces together in producing clocks and became the Hamilton Sangamo Corporation. In 1931, a company called GTI bought the Hamilton Sangamo Corporation. This company owned Big Ben and Seth Thomas, and this is the reason why you can find Sangamo motors in Seth Thomas clocks. Because of these different companies, you can tell how old your clock is depending on the name on the back plate. Uh, if they were made from 1926 to 29, it'll say Sangamo clock. If they were made from 29 to 31, it'll say Hamilton Sangamo. And if they read the Sangamo electric clock or just the Sangamo clock, those were made after 1931. The plate on the back of this one reads Hamilton Sangamo, which means it was made from sometime from 29 to 31. All of this is interesting, but unless I'm able to come up with a start lever to reattach here, there's no way I'm going to be able to repair this clock. So what I started to do was see if I could find another Sangamo clock. And I was fortunate enough to come up with this one. Another one from eBay. This one was all of $18. And what I was happy to see is that 
this has a start lever and it has a set knob. What's interesting with this is the power cord seems to have a plug that attaches here. That's missing. I have to figure out a way to make a plug or get parts to fit it or somehow in order to try to get this one uh, to see if, it, if it's running at all. The plate on the back of this one reads the Sangamo clock. So this one was made after 1931. So what I plan to do is I'm going to start with the first clock. I'll get this set up on my workbench, open it up, take it apart, remove the uh, start lever from this clock and see if this one is even running. And then try to, if not, then try to figure out uh, some other way to come up with getting it to work. So let me get set up for all of that. First, let me remove the clock from the case here. Okay, what I want to do next is remove the start lever from the other clock and put it onto here. So to do that, have to undo these couple of screws, which will get the back plate off. Let me work on that. I've got one out. And before the plate comes off, I have to remove the set knob. And this one is held on by a very small screw. Definitely don't want to lose that. And pretty much we're looking at the same, the same motor mechanism, everything here, I imagine. And this start lever is held on by a small screw here. Let me undo that. Okay. Give me a moment and I'm going to attach this to here and then we'll, we'll give it a whirl, see if it works. I've attached the lever. I have it plugged in. Let me turn it on. Let's see what happens. And it looks like it's running. Let's see if I can show this. And there's the second hand disc revolving. How about that? It works. So my plan now is going to be, number one, now that I know it works, I'm gonna to try to come up with fabricating a base for the case and figure out a way to hook up a power cord here, place this lever back onto this clock and see if this one works. So let me get to work on all of that. And once I know what order I'm going to work it, I will come back. Okay, I took the start lever from this clock and I placed it onto this one. One thing I forgot to mention on this first one is when I was turning the set knob, I was noticing that the hands didn't move. And when I took a closer look, I realized that for some reason, the set knob stem here popped out of its the hole in the uh, plate back here and this gear is sort of sitting on top of the gear instead of alongside of it and I'll show you how it's supposed to look you can you can see the little hole there where it's supposed to be in if I pick up the other one here you can see it's in the proper hole and th these gears are lining up so what I'm hoping I can do with this one is kind of nudge this into the proper position hopefully nothing will bend and that'll keep me from having to take this whole thing apart as far as hooking up a power cord to this one what i came up with are these little connectors and i've attached them to a power cord a couple of them looks like this and i'm just going to fit these over the contacts here
and I'll plug it in. I'll turn it on and we'll give the lever a flip. And it looks like this one is running too. So how about that? Both of these clocks are working. That's, that's rather impressive. I'm going to have to come up with a more suitable way to connect this because this is kind of a, what I would call a jury rig. I may be able to, let me shut this off. I may be able to come up with a similar connector. I have a Seth Thomas chime clock that I couldn't repair and it had a Sengamo motor in it with one of these. And I think I can take that part, which just had a couple of screws here that I can wrap the wire around and it's sort of like this. It'll end up looking like this. Anyway, um, the next thing I'm going to work on will be to try to replace this connector here. I came up with a replacement part for the uh, connector here. It's from the clock I couldn't fix. And this just has a couple of screws that I can wrap the wire around. So let me see if I can remove this and see what's underneath it. Oh, I thought this was just a nut holding this point down. The whole thing is sort of a screw. Well, that makes it much easier. I don't need the whole part to replace. Just these two screws. Put that one there. Now I can just attach a power cord to those. Doesn't get any easier than that. I've also reached out to the Sangamo website that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they also sell parts and I've requested information on how I can order a start lever as well as a set knob and the screw and the screw for the uh, start lever as well. What I want to work on next is to see if I can pop this uh, set knob stem back into the hole that might take a little bit of doing for me, so I'll play with it on my own. And once I think I have it, I'll come back. Okay, I'm happy to say that I was able to maneuver the whole stem here back into the hole. It now turns properly. And another thing I've noticed that I can mention on this other clock, the plate on the back of it, hard to see, but etched into here, it says 5378. So apparently this clock was serviced at one point in 1978. And both of these look rather clean as far as the gears. Usually I'm used to seeing a lot of built up funky oil and sludge and that kind of thing because we're talking clocks that are 90 plus years old. But both of these look clean enough that I'm thinking because they're both running, I'm not gonna have to take these apart. What I do plan on though is I want to remove the dial, or uh, rather the glass and the rim, possibly the hands, clean everything up, especially this one. This one's a bit dirtier. Another thing that I have done is once I realized that this one was able to uh, be repaired, I had mentioned that I needed to get a, a base for the case on this one. So I picked up, it's just some pieces of pine, but I believe that this is going to work out fine. Hard to see this way, but. And I have a friend who has a lot of woodworking tools, and I believe with a router, he'll be able to kind of give it a bit of a curved finish all the way around. And then once I have this stained up, I think it's going to end up looking rather good. So I'll go ahead and clean these up. And then it's a matter of waiting for the parts that I want to order, as well as doing the work on the other case. And once all of that is completed, I'll be ready to put everything back together. 
it's been quite a while, but I'm happy to say that my friend Larry did a great job in carving the wood that I'm going to use for the base. You can see what he did to the three sides here, nicely beveled, sort of a double bevel on it. And I think that when I position the case on top of this, it's going to end up having a real nice look, especially once it's stained and polished. What I have to do next, and I'll try to explain what I'm going to be doing and showing as much as I can, but it's it'll take a lot of time. I have to position the, the case over it, and then I want to drill holes through the the uh, base into the bottom of the case so that I can secure it with screws as well as with a, a bit of glue. And as I said, that's going to take a while. I'll get to work on that and I'll just try to show you the steps uh, as I go along the way. The first thing I did was I traced the outline of the case on the bottom of the wood. And where the four dots are is where I plan to drill the holes that are going to line up with the underside of the case same four dots here. Once I've drilled those holes, I'm going to then line everything up, fasten it together with some screws, and then I'll check to make sure I'm happy with just how everything is sitting. So let me get to work on that. And once that's been completed, I will continue. Okay, I've drilled the holes and placed the screws into the base. Let me just move these clocks out of the way here so I can show you. And I've secured it to the bottom and I'm very happy with the positioning of it. Everything's lined up really pretty exactly where it has to be. What I'm going to do next, two things. One is remove the screws and then drill a countersink hole, which will allow these screws to be flush with the wood so that they won't be elevated. And once I've done that, then I'll figure out what stain I have that's going to best match the color of this wood. So let me work on all that and then I'll continue. I have three stains that I experimented with. One of them is called a light oak, this color here, but it's too light compared to the case, obviously. Another is ebony, which is pretty much black, and that's not going to blend. A third is called espresso, like the coffee bean, and I think that this is the one that's going to be the closest match to the color of the case. So I'm going to go ahead and stain this whole thing up, all sides of it, and once it's cured and dried, then I'm going to look to permanently attach it to the case. I'm giving it three coats of stain, and I think it's going to be a pretty close match to the case. Not 100%, but I think it's going to look good. What I want to do next is go over this with my Howard's Feed and Wax so I can give it a bit of a, a shine. I've already gone over the case with my Restore Finish as well as the wax polish. And that's taking out a lot of the scuffs and scratches that were in here. So I'll get this waxed up and then I'll attach it and then I'll continue. The base is attached. I think it came out with a nice shine. The color isn't 100% of a match, but I think the contrast gives it a pretty good look. Let me move this out of the way here. And what I want to do next is put the spindles back into place. One will go here and here. And I just need to use a little bit of wood glue to secure these. Once this is done, then I'll go back to what I said I was going to do with the clock, which is remove the, uh, the rim, take off the hands, and try to clean everything up in here as best I can. So. Once these are glued into position, I'll start working again on this. Okay, the spindles are in. I can put this aside for now. And the way this comes apart, there are some notches here. This just sort of rotates off. And let's see how easy it is to unscrew this. It's not too bad.
It looks like there's a lot of dirt under these hands. Okay, I have a screw and a little washer here. minute hand and let's see about protecting this I should have a piece of cardboard here somewhere here we go See how the uh, dial comes off of here. Oh, here we go. Oh, there's a date on here. It says April, maybe the 9th, 1931. See if you can see that. So now it's official. This clock's from 1931. What I'm going to go ahead and do is just look to clean up as much of the dirt off of here as I can. I want to be very gentle with it. I don't know, nothing harsh. I don't want to remove any of the uh, writing. And then clean up a lot of the grease that seems to be around the, uh, the minute dial. So once I have everything nice and clean, then I'll look to reassemble it. I'm also going to clean up the glass. And one interesting thing I'm seeing I have read that these clocks are considered to be some of the uh, best made or the most well-made ones of its time. And usually I would have expected the glass to kind of fall out of here. But it appears that there's a metal rim that was inserted holding it in place. So this, this is not coming out, but I'll just, I'll be able to clean it up regardless. So let me get to work on all that and then I'll come back. I've cleaned up the dial and found that these numbers are not just painted on here, but they're sort of etched or carved into the metal. They're recessed. Uh, it gives it a really nice sharp look. I have not seen that before. I also cleaned up the hands as well as the glass and the rim is polished up pretty good as well. Next, I am going to reposition everything onto the clock. We'll start with the dial. And then the minute hand, which only seats one way. And once it's on, you want to turn it to the 12. And then remove it and seat the hour hand pointing at the 12. Then you could put the minute hand back on. Come on. And we have the washer. And then the screw. And that can be a little tricky. But I think I got it.
Okay. Next, we'll slide the glass rim back in place. And before inserting this into the clock case, I have to attach the paddle cord. So let me work on that. First, I have to slip the wire through the back of the plate. And then through the back of the case. Then I place a knot in it. And now I'm going to connect the wire to the back of the screws over here. And that'll take a couple of minutes, so let me work on that and then I'll continue. The wire is attached. Before putting the clock back into the case, I just have to remove the set knob again. Okay, So what's left to do is secure the back plate with these two screws, reattach the set knob, and then I'll be ready to position it on my table and plug it in and give it a go. So let me do all of that. I've got it set up and it's plugged in. I'll give the start lever a flip. And it's running. So there you have it, a Hamilton Sangamo. It's from April of 1931. That makes it about 92 and a half years old. And I'm pretty pleased with how this one came out. It's definitely not looking its age. Um, my plan is to eventually, I will repair and restore the other Sangamo clock that you saw earlier in the video. And uh, I'll definitely show you the progress on that one. That pretty much wraps things up. Bye for now.